Well, welcome um, PAC members, uh, district members and community members. We appreciate you um, joining our PAC, PAC meeting this evening. And uh, I like to call this uh, meeting to order at 6.02 p.m. And it seems like we have quite a few people here. I'm gonna turn this over to Steve so that we can uh, start our, this is our first time. So let's hope it all goes well, everyone. Um, we're gonna be doing a Kahoot to see what we all know about um, the LCAP. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Kim. <clears throat> Um, are you going to share it, Kim, or is, is that? Yeah, I'm going to share. Okay, cool. Making sure. Um, so yeah, we put together a Kahoot um, for our uh, community building. Uh, should be a lot of fun. We're going to be asking some questions, um, and it's kind of a, a fun competition type scenario where we're going to see what we know and and learn at the same time. So. Um, so if you're not familiar with Kahoot, it's a collaborative tool. Um, and I think Kim's about to put it in the uh, chat. Mm -hmm. It may not link because it has .it at the end. Um, so you may have to copy and paste it into your browser. And then you'll be able to enter that game pin. And it looks like there's a space there, but you don't put a space. So it'd be 7113269, no space. Um, and that would give you get you access. Um, so there it is. Yeah, see there's so there's no I, for some reason it doesn't hyperlink. So just copy that link and put that into your browser. And I'll let I'll let folks take their time and get used to this. You can also do it on your phone. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. Thanks, we'll April. So you're gonna want to punch that in and then uh, Kim will know um, on the back end it, when everyone is um, ready to go it's, it'll say I can't remember what the message is but it'll say you're ready to go or something like that you have all of your names yeah <laughs> and there's cool music too so that's <laughs> video game all right I guess we got three people in so far. Yeah, and All right. Steve, uh, Stephanie just joined us. If you'd like to give her uh, a little some directions. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, uh, Stephanie, we uh, Kim put a link, uh, a Kahoot link. Um, you're gonna have to copy and paste it because Zoom doesn't rec recognize a .dot .it um, as a as a, uh, a link. So you have to copy that and put it into your browser, your favorite browser. And then um, you'll enter that passcode, no spaces, and it'll take you into to the Kahoot. And the Kahoot's just a fun uh, kind of question and answer. It's a fun competition to you will you'll kind of see, but it's a, it's a fun competition to see what we know about LCAP, and and we have some fun questions for you. Okay. Is anyone having a hard time with um, getting in? I was at first only because I can't actually copy and paste from the chat. Oh. So I just uh, typed it into my web browser. Okay. Thanks for letting us know, Amber. So if it's not letting you copy and paste, then yet yeah, luckily it's not, it's not a long extension there. <clears throat> I'm able to bump in now. I'm in here. I can hear you guys now. Awesome. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. We're going to get started in about one minute. The game takes about maybe three to four minutes. Did you get in, Stephanie? Get in what? Zoom? No, into Kahoot. Girl, I just barely got into Zoom. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Stephanie. <laughs> I, don't open a Google I don't want to touch nothing. <laughs> if you open 
Just leave me be like still mode. <laughs> okay. Are you if good? You new Somebody Google, do it for me. If you open a new Google tab and you just uh, in in the search bar, write Kahoot. I'm scared. It'll take you right to it. Or I'm you scared. can even if you have your smart oh, PC, so I'd rather just leave it be and just watch y'all. <laughs> I barely can even get my Zoom going on my PC and <laughs> collaborate with it. Okay. I think so we're going to get started now. Okay. Um, I think everyone's in that wants to get in. All right. We're going to start. Here we go. Be as quick as you can go. Yeah. Yep. How many state priorities are we responsible for? Quick, get your pack, your El Cap pack binders. <laughs> <laughs> just, just for fun, so don't feel bad if you don't know it, and, and you can feel good for yourself if you do know it. It's okay. <laughs> oh, Elizabeth came on top on that one. Yeah. <laughs> what are the eight state priorities? Or a primary source for locating these. Safety. I didn't get the answer right, though. Yes. Oh, A is on top. <laughs> Not one of them. Not one of them. Nice. Elizabeth, you're on fire. <laughs> oh, retains the lead. Yep, green act. Still on top, Elizabeth. Must be quick on the draw here. <laughs> I got it on my cell phone. I think that's why. Okay. Not a good, another not. I like this. We got to do this more often. <laughs> when I'm scared to log in. <laughs> Whoa, sorry. Oh, no need. Oh, somebody was getting ahead of somebody. you. <laughs> I went too quick. Let's see who won. Drum roll, drum roll. Number, yay. Yes, I'm finally on the board. <laughs> on the board. <laughs> Who got the top one? Roll. Tom. Tom. Yeah, yeah, of, course. <laughs> of course, Tom. I, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. We're going to do a little, a little feed, feedback really quick. Yeah. So if you that guys, was fun. Not only that, but I should be disqualified yeah. because I helped test this before. <laughs> Guys there were different questions though they, were, they weren't all the same questions yeah does your feedback come up oh there we go all right that's wonderful to see okay awesome well that was fun thanks for participating and i always have the there we go so let me get this stuff off my screen real quick and pull up my, all right, at this time, um, we'll have the updates from our board liaison and superintendent. 
I just wanted to uh, thank John for a wonderful presentation to the board on Tuesday night on the local control and accountability plan mid-year update, which was required this year by the state of California. And he did a wonderful job of updating the entire board. So thank you so much. And I look forward to hearing the discussion tonight that will add even more depth to that. Thank you. Is our superintendent um, here? He is unable to be here, so I'm filling in for him. And Thanks so um, I think I know everybody, but I'll just introduce myself again. My name is Melissa Bassanelli, and I'm the deputy superintendent for schools and student support. I'm really excited to be here. Um, just a quick little update. Our schools have been working so hard over the past seven weeks to keep um, our schools safe and healthy and remain open amidst the surge and um, with, a, with quite a shortage in terms of personnel. And so I just wanted to extend my gratitude to everybody who contributed to maintaining our schools and keeping them open during the surge. I know that our staff are really looking forward to having a break next week. And so if you happen to be on our schools tomorrow and you run into teachers or administrators or secretaries, custodians, just um, wish them well and give them a big thanks. Uh, they've been working really hard on behalf of our students um, for the past seven weeks. So um, that's all, thank you. And I'm just glad to be here and be part of the conversation. Thank you, Melissa. Um, at this time, Laura, um, if there's any visitors that would like to comment, Hey, thanks. Thank you, Kim. At this time, this is an opportunity for any visitors that are joining us tonight to offer a comment based upon items that are not on the agenda. You will have two minutes to speak. And at this time, are, do we have any visitors that would like to speak? If so, please come off mute. All right. With that, we will move forward. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, John, if you would like to give the update on the LCAT mid-year uh, annual update. Great, thank you, Kim. Um, so for our next agenda item, uh, we're gonna participate in a data conversation that's gonna help uh, inform our next steps and improvement work with our LCAP as we plan for the 2022-23 school year. And so this evening, we're gonna be reviewing our 21-22 LCAP metrics outcome data. So with regard to our LCAP actions and metrics, at this point in the school year, all of our actions are currently in progress of being implemented. However, some of the metric outcomes are known and some of them are unknown. So for example, our district climate survey is currently being administered. So this would be a metric outcome that is unknown at this time. However, the state assessment data was recently released and is available. So an update on all the actions and metrics that are currently available at this point in the school year uh, was provided by Laura as attachments earlier this week. So the ongoing ebb and flow of the pandemic has definitely impa impacted the implementation of our LCAP actions and it's uh, resulted in um, many challenges. However, in implementing our LCAP, we have also been able to increase and expand many programs, services, and resources for our students. Um, it's resulted in many successes as well. So as you can see here, some of the successes that we have experienced uh, have included increased local control at the site level to address targeted student and site needs, um, as well as expanded site level staffing, summer offerings, community partnerships, uh, materials and supplies, um, as well as enrichment and intervention opportunities. Uh, and then conversely, some of the challenges that we have experienced uh, have included staff and substitute shortages, uh, keeping schools safe and open during, um, during surges, and then maintaining continuity of learning and implementation of programs. So when reviewing the data this evening, um, we would like to offer some considerations related to the metrics. So although the testing requirement was waived for the 2019-2020 school year, in 2021, we were required to administer statewide academic assessments in English language arts, mathematics um, and science, as well as the English language proficiency assessments. So the California Department of Education recognized that the administration of these state assessments was not feasible uh, because most districts were in remote learning until well into the spring. So we were able to administer local assessments in lieu of CASP. 
So while educators, parents, guardians, community partners are always encouraged to use a variety of data uh, when making decisions about education programs and policies, um, in this time of COVID and disrupted data, the Department of Education has recommended that direct comparisons to the 2021 data test results from prior years is not advisable. So for example, if we look here, in 2018 and 19, and this would have been prior to COVID, approximately 97% of uh, San Juan eligible students were assessed in ELA and mathematics. Uh, but in 2019 and 2020, the testing requirement was waived, so no San Juan students completed the CASP. But then when you look at 2021, uh, LEAs, so districts like San Juan, had flexibility to administer the state assessment or a local assessment. So in San Juan, only 11th grade students completed the CASP, and that represents approximately 6% of all eligible students because our third and eighth grade students were administered the iReady local assessment in lieu of CASP instead. Another factor for us to consider are the shifts in assessment administration. So again, for example here, before COVID in 2018 and 19, all assessments were administered in person. But then in March of 2019, 2020, we began our transition to administering assessments virtually. Um, in the case of CASP, the assessment was waived entirely. And in the case of the IB exam, students were assessed virtually using local internal assessments. And then in 2020, 2021, we started virtually, but then we're able to include in-person administration whenever possible as we transition to hybrid learning. And then finally, as we look at this school year, our fall and winter assessments were administered in person and that we plan on being able to administer our spring assessments in person as well. So collectively, this information is really intended to provide some context and considerations as to the, the what, when, uh, and how assessments were administered as we review and interpret the data that we're gonna be looking at this evening. And so then uh, from 2017 to 2019, the California school dashboard performance indicators were used to identify districts for what's called differentiated assistance. And due to the impact of COVID-19, districts identified for differentiated assistance continues to be based on 2019 uh, performance data. So because our California dashboard graduation rate and college career readiness performance indicator was read for three uh, consecutive years for uh, these two student groups, San Juan is required to write a specific LCAP goal or goals to outline support for students with disabilities and foster youth that focuses on improving graduation uh, and college and career readiness outcomes. So uh, we are currently working on engaging students and families who represent our foster youth and students with disability community, as well as staff that work directly with these two groups. So for example, um, with regard to our students who receive special education services, uh, we're gonna be working with our special education department and special education community advisory committee known as the CAC. And then even just as a matter of fact, this morning, we just held a listening session with some community members who have, um, who have a student uh, with IEPs to get some input. So this work is, is already underway. John, is that included with 504s too? Um, no. Okay. And then finally for the metrics overview here, um, earlier this week, a copy of the metrics was sent for the PAC to review prior to our meeting this evening. But before we get into the data conversation, we just wanted to take a moment and orient the group to the, the document here. So you'll notice that at the top of the attachment, um, a key is provided that defines the abbreviations and terms. And Laura there is doing a great job circling it with her <laughs> cursor. So thanks, Laura. Having fun. <laughs> um, and then, Let's see here. And then this is followed by a list of our LCAP metrics that are associated with each goal that we use to assess progress. And so you'll see here, there are eight different columns. So in column one, this provides the LCAP goal and metric, um, uh, the LCAP goal the metric is associated with. Column two uh, provides a description of the metric. Column three, provides our baseline year that we are using to measure progress. So you're gonna notice here that the years might vary. And this is due to a variety of factors, but one factor was that uh, the state determined that some metrics were not valid 
due to the impact of COVID-19 resulting in us having to use previous year data as a baseline. So that's why there is some variation in baseline data years. In columns four through six, this provides data across multiple years from 2018-19 all the way through 2020-21. And then column seven provides data that is currently available at this point in the 21-22 school year. And then finally, the last column uh, provides our 23-24 desired outcome that reflects the results that we would uh, like to see in, in three years. All right, so to frame our data conversation this evening, we're gonna focus on the following three questions to guide us through the inquiry process of making observations, asking questions, and then offering some recommendations for consideration. So we're gonna begin by providing you with 10 minutes to review the notes that you took on the data that was shared prior to the meeting. Um, we will, listen, if you feel free to turn off your mic and camera if you prefer. And then what we'll, we will do is we'll return in 10 minutes together as a full group to begin our discussion. Um, Laura is gonna attach the metrics, actions, and note catcher in the chat for you as well, if needed. And then during this 10 minutes here, I'm gonna stick around and answer any questions that you, you, you may have. So um, while you're reviewing your notes, while you're reviewing your data, if you have any clarifying questions, um, I will be here to offer my assistance as best as I possibly can. <laughs> so hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions. Could you put those questions back up just really quickly for a second? Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. We can actually put those probably in the chat as well. Let's see if we can redirect. Thank you. There we go. Cut them. Yeah, and I think I'm going to try to put them in the chat. So why don't we do this? Um, it's 624 right now. Why don't we? Make it 11 minutes, we'll come back at 6.35. So if you wanna turn off your camera, feel free to do so. And if you have some questions, go ahead. And then Elizabeth, I'm gonna work on putting those questions in the chat for you. Thank you. No problem. All right, everybody. So we're gonna come back to the main room here. And Laura, if you wouldn't mind, we'll just share our, uh, the Jamboard here. So we'll go for our next, um, uh, our next part of our meeting here. Yeah, so I'm putting the links to the Jamboard into the chat box that we'll be using. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead and open it. And While Laura's doing that, um, Stephanie, I just wanted to clarify on your question. I was processing that during this uh, think time here. There does not need to be, uh, it is not required for a goal to be written for students who currently have 504 plans. However, there may be, for example, a student who might be a foster youth student who may uh, qualify and have a 504 plan that may be included in this process. So I just wanted to um, clarify. Okay, yeah, because okay. I, was, I was wondering, so if a student was for foster care with the 504, yes. Correct, I just wanted to clarify that. So I, you know, I just needed okay, to make cool. your okay. question. So, so that you. applies to Nora. There you go. Okay. Thank you. All, All right. right. All right. And then Laura, um, are we able to zoom in? Or <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, we will. All right. Excellent. So as we get started here, yeah, if we'll just scroll up. Thank you. Um, we just want to take a, a minute here. Um, so to begin our conversation this evening, we wanted to offer a few examples. Then we'll go through the process together as a full group, and then we're gonna transition into small groups. So I just wanted to offer an example here, or two examples of uh, how this process might work. So you'll notice that on the first sticky note on the far left under noticings, I made an observation, and I see that the chronic absenteeism rate for homeless students in TK through eighth grade is uh, 54%, which is 20.7% greater than the overall rate. So this observation then led me to um, led some to me to being a little more curious and wonder and have some questions about that that noticing, and if you go to column two, so my wondering was, what actions are currently in place to support our students experiencing homelessness with attendance, and what might we be missing? And then that is leading me uh, to some possible considerations moving forward, which might be to consider adjusting action one point three. Um, 
which would be to include more personalized outreach to students experiencing homelessness in order to identify additional needs. So if you look at this example, my noticing is strictly observational. Uh, my wondering is in the form of a question. It, it's, it's about me being curious about what I'm observing. And then I tried my best here on this third one here to try to connect my recommendation to an existing action in our LCAP plan. So let's look at just another example here. Um, again, I'm going to stick with chronic absenteeism, which is the first metric we look at. So I noticed that our English language learners and reclassified fluent English proficient students have lower chronic absenteeism rates compared to the overall rate. So this is leading me to wonder, well, what are we doing to support our English learners and re reclassified fluent English proficient students that is resulting in this positive outcome? And so then a possible recommendation might be to consider exploring uh, what's working to support our English learner and um, reclassified fluent English proficient students with attendance to see if the strategy might work um, for our homeless and African-American students as well. So those are just two examples. So based off of that, I thought maybe we could try one together and then we can set you off into breakout rooms with our facilitators to do it. So um, uh, let's see here. Would someone like to offer, uh, by the way, a reclassified fluent English proficient student. Um, this would be a student who um, is starts as an English learner. And um, after receiving, let's say English learner services is able to pass um, with a four on the uh, LPAC summative assessment, and then are now reclassified as an English proficient, uh, as reclassified as fluent English proficient. So let's get an example here. Would someone like to offer an observation or a noticing? And then Laura will jot it down on the, the Jamboard for us as an example. Well, let's see, it looked like um, the uh, career technical education completion rate had a fairly significant improvement. Is that? Okay, so Tom, you're looking at which one here? Um, it's, well, it's career technical uh, CTE completion. Mm -hmm. And let's see, I just made, made some notes um, or made, made that note. But uh, I don't think I wrote down which. Um, okay. Let's see what, what LCAP number that was. Well, it's okay. So in your CTE completion, you what was your noticing? Um, that it there was a uh, significant improvement. Um, so it can just be specific from 2018, 19, all the way to 2020, 21. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. All right, and then let's just build off of that. So based off of the observation that Tom made, what he sees in the data, um, what is a wondering or what might you be curious about considering the fact that our CTE completion rate has improved um, from 2018-19 uh, to 2020-21, so to improve over time. So what, what might be a, something you're wondering about or a question that you may have based off of that observation? Oh. Oh, actually, I'm looking at it now. It, it was actually a significant improvement from 2019 to um, 2020. It, it seemed like it sort of balanced back up to what it was originally um, in, in 2018. All right. Thanks for clarifying, Tom. So is there someone else in the group who might want to just make a wondering or is curious about something related to that piece of data, that observation? Uh, when I see a significant improvement, I tend to wonder about what um, sort of intervention or preventative services were put in place to sort of boost that and how to kind of replicate that in a way that is equitable in schools that um, might also mirror the, the data or the statistics um, where 
originally there were needs for improvement and and then how do we kind of implement that um, in the same way that it was implemented where it was successful right. i don't know if that made sense but <laughs> that's where my mind goes no thank you so much for for sharing i'll just let laura type out i think we run out of words at some point but we'll we'll get it down there so laura uh, do you want to read what you wrote there yeah here it is right here so Amber, tell me if this captures it. I said, I wonder what source of intervention or preventative services were put in place to boost this. Maybe I should put this outcome. And I wonder how to replicate this to implement in the same way where it was successful. That's pretty solid. Yep, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right. And so, and again, just to get you thinking here, if we think about a recommendation, so which of our maybe LCAP actions might we consider adjusting uh, to improve um, outcomes based off of that wondering. And again, someone else might have a, a, a recommendation or a consideration uh, to offer. I guess a, a general comment is um, that it seems like the, the data is so um, changed or the, the influence of the COVID and the, um, uh, let's see, the, well, not, not in-person classes, the, the online has kind of like overwhelmed being able to tease out the influence uh, of of the district being able to make adjustments. So it's really difficult to take a look at those numbers, see them bounce from one academic year to another and try to figure out, you know, how, how do you separate the influence of the pandemic and the, the responses uh, to um, at home you know, stay at home um, to the influences of making changes to the program. Mm -hmm. So Tom, it sounds like that's like another wondering that you have. Yeah. Okay. And that, that might be okay. Sometimes we, sometimes it'll be, um, uh, it'll be clear that maybe you do have a consideration or a recommendation in mind um, based off of what you observe. And other times it might just uh, live with our questions and wonderings. And that's a great place to be as well. You know, asking questions is good. So this might be an example where we um, where we just find and we notice that we're living more in our wonderings and that's okay too. So based off of this, um, are there any clarifying questions about the process that we'd like uh, that we're trying to engage in this evening in our in our and how to have this data conversation beginning with noticings, wonderings, and if applicable, maybe offering some considerations as needed. I think there's any questions on what we're supposed to be doing, but someone did put a question in the chat. Oh. Yes, um, Amber put, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, um, Amber, because I was noticing the same thing. Um, right now we're set up to do three breakout rooms. I was thinking maybe we should go down to two, but Amber's question is, I feel like our participant group is smaller tonight and wonder if we can stay as one large group. I'm open to that. Is there, would any, um, does anyone have a preference, Kim? Do you want to weigh in? Um, I'm open to that. Okay. So we can just continue here then. So actually, Laura, I know we're running out of room, so we might just have to keep adding uh, jam boards here and then we'll clean it up. So we can go to a, a second jam board here. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I, I, sorry. I also just am being mindful of um, our last conversation. Well, I was gone in January, but our last conversation we had um, about new uh, PAC members. And I think that there's so much value in just having open dialogue with um, multiple minds. So thank you. No problem. So Laura, we can go to the next uh, slide because we're just going to do this as we've been doing it here. 
I would like to know uh, something from our PAC though, as before we move forward, um, just with a show of hands, does everyone ha did everyone feel comfortable with looking at the data and understanding it? Just with a show of hands. Can you let me know? I'm just going to be honest here. I've been working on four triennial reports, so I didn't get a chance to review it before our meeting. Okay. Thank you for your honesty. April. So I can't honestly say I understood it or didn't understand it. I just didn't get an opportunity because I've been busy with triennial reviews for my students. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. And is there, let's see. So I don't see many hands. So does that mean that majority of you are not understanding how to read this data? Can you give me a show of hands for that? If you're not really understanding how to read the data and understand it. If I can chime in again, for me, um, one of the things going back to that last screen, I really appreciated seeing the post-its as examples that were already set there. But to be entirely honest, it tripped me up a little bit because then I was like, oh my gosh, I need my binder to see what are the recommendations aligned with 1.13 or what, you know, whatever it is, like, I don't know LCAP quite like that. And so I think that that's a little bit what tripped me up when it came time to thinking about recommendations, specifically like worded aligned with what, um, what it is as a pack. So Amber, I want to alleviate some, some stress here. Like we are, this is new for, for all, a lot of us. And so we're, what we're hoping to do is to, develop our capacity in this area and replicate this process as we look at data over time. So this is not this, we will be able to look at data this evening. We will have an opportunity to look at data um, at future meetings. And so over time, we will be able to become more familiar with our actions in the data because we'll have this practice to do so. So this is our, our starting point with it. So uh, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah, I think John that we do need to stay in one room then because it just the pulse seems like everyone needs some assistance getting from no, noticing to one on two recommendations. Perfect, perfect. So yes, let's do that. And so um, if you don't mind, we might just keep adding uh, Jamboard slides as we run out of space, but why don't we start? Uh, Can I make a suggestion? It might help us just one up just on just staying in noticings and wonderings. Sure. And not you know, and, and, and just kind of warming up in terms of what are we seeing in the data and what are we curious about? Perfect. Okay, that's great. All right, so I'll just turn it up to the group here. Any, another noticing, and we'll just kind of go back and forth between noticings and wonderings. Elizabeth. Okay, I, I had something, yeah. It, when I was looking at some of the, I'm not even sure what page this is on, some of the statistics under the text level, I ready reading K through two, it seemed to me without running the math on it myself that that was where I saw the biggest drop for the foster youth and homeless children there. The numbers really dropped down low. They dropped down low overall. So I kind of agree with Tom that that can be hard to parse out. Um, but that seemed to me, I don't know if the younger kids were being, anyway, that was, I guess, my wondering then was, was COVID or whatever else might have been impacting that, um, affecting the younger kids perhaps up to a stronger degree than the middle age or, or sorry, the middle school or high school students. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth, is that your, I put that under- I'm sorry, I jumbled it all together. The I, noticing, it's okay, so, okay, so funny, noticing I, was the, um, the kindergarten to second grade, I reading, I ready reading scores, mm -hmm. text level, I ready reading scores dropped off pretty significantly more, more so than other columns. I could see it for the foster youth and homeless children. I got that. Um, that just looked like a really big jump when I was looking at those numbers. And then I guess then the wondering that that led me to kind of think about was, you know, are we looking at a bigger impact or is there more help needed for children who are in the, the younger years, I guess, than the middle school or high school students? Are they feeling more of an impact? with COVID or whatever else. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. I was noticing under the suspension rate um, that uh, for African-American students, 
that it was over double of any of the other um, groups and that it um, had its largest disparity um, in the 2021-22 year. Kim, can you repeat that? And then I'm also wondering if maybe um, one other person can help me do some uh, re recording of these sticky notes. Maybe one person take wonderings and I'll take noticings. Is that a possibility? Tom, do you mind helping with that? Okay, sure. Thanks, Tom. So Kim, you said suspension rate for African-American students. Yes. What was that? Were doubled? So um, yes, we're double compared to all of the other groups. So they were at 10.09, where the next group under was at a 4.25, 2.86, 3.56. And the disparity was at 17.29%, which was the highest out of all the years. Mm -hmm. Steve, can you make sure to address everyone in um, the chat too, please? Thank you. Amber, it was just some nonsense that I put in the chat, appreciating our pack. Um, <laughs> That's not nonsense, Amber. Awesome. <laughs> we just problem solve on the fly and support each other, and I love it. Um, the the um, noticing that I wanted to chime in with was around attendance. Um, the last couple of years do feel a little bit like a blur at this point, but if I'm not mistaken, the height of the pandemic when we had to go into distance learning was 2019-2020 school year. Um, and I noticed that attendance at that time was higher. So I guess maybe also I'm answering my question as I'm acknowledging that it was higher um, than it is in the previous year. And, um, and even in this current year, it looks like we do have data for 2021, 2022. And I don't know, in my mind, I would think that there were more challenges accessing distance learning and counting attendance during like the peak of pandemic than when schools are actually open. And so um, my wondering <laughs> sort of around that, um, is what are we doing to kind of look into and problem solve those attendance issues for students um, getting to school? I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm going to kind of go down a rabbit hole here, Laura or Tom or whoever's taking notes on the wonderings. But um, I'm thinking about uh, the data also being kind of broken down into a grade level um, and considering that for younger students, I, this is like their first go at being at school and what are the rates there versus for students who were kind of already acclimated to school. Um, and yeah, just that first point that I made was kind of my key is what are we doing to kind of like dig into why are those uh, rates still, still up or am I reading this wrong? Is it that students have, no, no, I'm reading it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love, I know that I think it's Laura that's adding the, uh, what you said is, is a question here. Mm -hmm. There we go, perfect. Thank you, Amber. Does someone else have a noticing? I have a couple more, but I do want to leave room. <laughs> Go ahead, Amber. Um, around parent engagement, just looking at um, 2018, 2019, again, in my mind, I think that the height of the pandemic when we had to kind of spring into distance learning was 2020. Um, 2018, 2019, I see the box is gray. And so to me, that tells me that we weren't measuring that at that time. Is that correct? No, Amber. So what um, it just means that for baseline year, we're using 2019, 20, which is why that that's why it's blank there because our baseline year is 2019, 20, not 2018, 19. Gotcha. That is helpful. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me, you guys, for one second. I'm going to have to step away for a minute because my son is kind of having a hard time dealing with a student that had died. That was his friend. 
So oh, just give me a minute. So okay, I, I, I'm not, I'm in and out trying to cook dinner and deal with him because he's trying to cope. He's been having a rough week. So okay. yeah, there's one of the students at San Juan High that had died died last Friday. Sorry so, to hear that. And um, go yeah. ahead. And take okay, care thank you. I, I'm still here trying to hear hear him bits and pieces, but just excuse me for one second. Uh -huh. okay. So Amber, did you want that to be a wondering now that you know why that box was grayed out or? No, my 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 question is less relevant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Happy to put something down there for you. I had another uh, noticing on suspension, and it is um, specific to African American students again. Um, that in twenty twenty in the twenty twenty one twenty twenty two data, that um, their rate was at twenty three point oh two, and I'm. Think, believing that that's days um, mm -hmm. compared to everyone else in this group, they were the most significant um, outside of foster youth. Mm -hmm. And it appears that that number had went down significantly, of course, um, 2020, 2021 with special ed having the highest numbers, but yet and still that trend still follows um, the 2018, 2019, and so on years. And so Kim, I just want to give you an opportunity with that observation. Is there a wondering, is there something you're curious about, like a question that you have related to that observation that we could take down for you as well? I guess my wondering probably would be, um, are students, are African-American students being treated the same way as all other students when it comes to dis discipline? Mm -hmm. It's like Tima's in the way. Oh, you got her. Thanks. I got you. it. <laughs> have Tima and Laura. We got this. <laughs> Oops, got I could... Great. Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Someone like to offer another observation? Yeah, I got one. Um, this is Steve. Um, staffing, uh, ethnic diversity. Um, there wasn't anything reported or un unavailable for this year. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering, I guess I'm noticing that there's nothing there and then I'm wondering why there's nothing there. Yeah, so that data is um, typically reported to us um, uh, at a later date. So that's just why you'll notice that some of this available data is just not available because we get it from the state and the state um, only administers or shares the data at certain times of the year. Okay, so that's one of those that wasn't, didn't have new data, got it. Correct. But just so you know, 21-22, there is data being collected. It's just not available at this time. That's why I was wondering. <laughs> there you go. That's why <laughs> Can we go back to, I feel like Kim already talked about chronic absenteeism. Can we reread what were the noticing and wonderings in there? Um, on the one that Kim uh, mentioned, Amber? Um, around attendance and chronic absenteeism. I just, that may have been someone else. Uh, was that on back here on this slide? Are you thinking chronic absenteeism, Amber? No. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that the example? It really wasn't from our group? That was the example. Got it. Okay. Okay. One of the, um, one of the questions I am wondering, looking at the overall and then noticing that um, homeless youth, foster youth, and African-American youth um, for chronic absenteeism are all um, over 44%. Um, Again, just kind of wondering what what is the communication there? I think um, I think that each school, from my understanding around attendance, um, each school kind of handles it differently, and um, I wonder what supports are put into place or like. I know there shouldn't have to be incentives for coming to school, but like what incentives, how are we energizing students and getting them enthusiastic about being at school? Um, 
to kind of up those numbers. And I think specifically when we when we think about our most at risk youth, um, homeless and foster youth, what are we doing to uh, intentionally connect and support those communities too? Um, I guess this is maybe a, a different um, note and maybe sort of out of the scope of the work that the district does, but um, for homeless youth, if we know that they're homeless, are we are we doing what we can to connect them to resources, to social services, county services that can um, get them back on their feet? Or are we just kind of knowing that the kid is homeless year after year and um, just, you know, kind of not really addressing all of the problems that, that come with Mm-hmm. And Amber, I might, um, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but I'll just share on chronic absenteeism is something for context that um, the chronic absenteeism rate is determined by the state and it includes all absences and it has not been adjusted since COVID-19. So just as a contextual point, a student who is absent because let's say they have, um, they've tested positive for COVID and are in quarantine, over multiple days could be considered chronically absent. absent. And, and a student who would, does not have COVID, but maybe had shown symptoms could also be included in that, in that count. Um, I just wanted to point that off as just a contextual piece um, uh, that that's a state um, requirement, how they do chronic absenteeism. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that context with that. I appreciate that. I think that leads me to another one. I'm sorry, I said I had a few, but I was looking at, um, where was it, test scores. Um, and I guess this one is, I don't know if it's right for LCAP or I don't, I don't know how to elevate this question, but I know a lot of parents, including myself, feel a little stressed out when we see that our students aren't meeting standards based on CASP scores, testing scores, whatever it is. But when we look at where students were at versus the disparity due to the pandemic and the struggle through COVID-19, I wonder at what point do we as a society, and again, I know I'm kind of going over like district stuff maybe, but when do we adjust our expectations? I And that I know is also sort of a weird thing to talk about with students, but seriously, like the whole world has experienced a pandemic. And when do we adjust the expectations of grade level to account for the disparity gaps that exist and also put the right interventions into place across the board so that students are able to compete and succeed and excel and get past this sort of gap that has been created and increased from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Does someone else have another noticing that they would like to add that from the metrics, from the data? Something I have one, um, the Steve. math state assessment area. Okay, can you be, uh, which one here, Steve? Uh, math state assessment. Ah, you were specific. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's okay. Um, um, so first is, no, I'm noticing um, a pretty sharp increase of, um, Let's see that they, they meet or exceed the standards. Um, uh, I guess I'm noticing an improvement there. And um, is this for all students or is I'm trying to kind of categorize where is it for K through 12 or so Steve I'll let me I'll help you out here cuz I know this one is a little confusing. So let me give you a say back and you stop me if where I go wrong, okay? Thank you. So you're looking at math state assessment and are you looking at specifically 2020 2021? 
Um, I gotta scroll up. I'm looking at, well, I'm looking at the data that's available as far as, I guess it's 2019, 2020, and then yeah, 2021. Okay, so if you look at 2018, 19, you'll notice that there's some scores there. You'll notice that 2019, 20 says unavailable because the state exam was waived. So in 2018, 19, the math state um, assessment, we had third through eighth graders plus 11th graders take the exam. So that's what that data represents that you see there. Okay. If you look at 2021 and you look, it says CASP 11th grade. In 2021, only 11th graders took it that year. So just to give you a comparison, right? So 18, 19, you had third through eighth and 11th grade. And then in 2021, CASP is only 11th grade. Is that a helpful clarification? It is. It kind of creates new questions in my yeah. brain, which, makes it, <laughs> it, which kind of makes it hard to kind of absorb the data and make sense of it. And that's a challenge. And that's what we were talking about. It's really difficult right now, given the context to begin to make comparisons. Yeah. So as we can still look at the data, but again, always taking into context, right? So thank you for, for asking that. That's, that's super helpful. Thank you. I think this is my last one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. For on track for graduation. On track. I think it's interesting that we're. Um, oh well, never mind. I just read the the fine print. Reread it. For middle school, less less relevant. But for high school, um, I noticed the disparity rate there. Mm -hmm. Um, I noticed for homeless fostering special education, English language learners, and African Americans. Um, Hispanics are in the 40 percentile, but um, what are we doing to, I wonder what we're doing around college prep programs. I think that that is an area that the district has expressed um, wanting to prioritize and wanting to be intentional about bringing in programs, but I don't know what programs are out there. Um, I'm someone who likes to plan ahead. My, my kid is only in fifth grade, but I'm already thinking about like what high school and how to kind of prepare him for, he wants to be an engineer, you know, like what's the high school for that? That's going to have the right college prep course work or, you know, classes available, um, for that. And how do parents know about that? How do kids know about that? If they're even out there, um, yeah. Perfect. So Amber, I'm just because I'm since you asked that if you look at some of the actions like 4.1, 4 4.3, um, and probably even like 4.7 and 4.8, you'll get a glimpse of some of the programs that are currently in, in our LCAP that address what you're saying. Um, the question, of course, there's still this won't give you answer your full question, but it's a good starting point if you wanted to kind of get a glimpse of what that looks like in our LCAP currently. Thank you. I am looking there now. Yeah. I have one more. Sure, Steve. I'm looking at the uh, A to G or CTE completion. Uh-huh. And I'm noticing um, from 2018, 2019 to the next year and to the next year, <clears throat> there's a sharp drop off in the next year from 50 to 40. And then there's a pretty steep increase to almost 53, but I'm noticing that students were struggling in a lot of areas, but they're still graduating. And I'm worried about, uh, I guess my, I'm gonna use the, uh, I'm, my wondering would be, are they being just pushed through and graduated with less skills than they should have had um, and being therefore less prepared for their next step in their life, whether it's college or not? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm concerned that the students that really felt it in the pandemic, which would have been some juniors and seniors in high school, that they're just less prepared than they could be or should have been or something like that. So, Steve, to clarify, I just um, the, what you're observing is that there's been a bit of an increase and you're wondering, is it like what is resulting in that increase? Um, kind of. I think it's it's a concern that there might be some. Um... 
I see. You, you think that the increase might be due to results of students getting pushed through, I believe. Pushed through, yeah, pushed through, kind of just allowed to graduate. I mean, I'm not saying not. I mean, I'm just saying it's being less prepared, I guess, than yeah. they would have been it had that not happened, I guess. I will say, again, I'm going to refer you to those same actions that I just said to Amber and the fours, and you'll see that there's been a real intentional focus in this in our LCAP with regard to things like our... Um, Naviance and APEX and tutoring and counseling that's been involved to support students in being able to meet A through G or CTE requirements. So I'm, again, I know we're in the data observation stage, but I just wanted to let you know that um, there has been an intentional focus on that, which is also in our LCAP for you to look at as well. Okay, is, is that still going on now that they're in person? That has no. continued to go on, that has been ongoing, yes. Great. Additional observations or wondering? Um, yes, I have an observation. Um, and looking at the, uh, just what Steve was talking about, the A through G, uh, the CTE, um, everything that has to do with like college readiness. I noticed that there's a great disparity for um, English language learners, special ed students and foster youth. And then Kim, associated with that, do you have a wondering connected to that observation that you would want to share? Well, my I do have one wondering uh, specific to foster youth. Mm -hmm. A lot of their numbers are at zero. So what is it because there are not the number of foster youth we have in our district is so low compared to the other numbers? Um, is that why they're at zero on so many of these? And then um, for our special ed students, are they are they receiving enough resources? Mm -hmm. When it notes special ed, is it all special ed, meaning mild, moderate, all the way to moderate, severe, mm -hmm. or is it like a specified chunk of special ed? That's good. Yeah, it's all students who um, are receiving special education services. It would be nice if that was broken up. It sure would be. Wanted to bring everyone's attention to the chat. April says, so when uh, looking at the percentages, are they reflective of how many students passed, how many students were absent, how many students are at or above grade level, et cetera? Maybe April, you want to expand on that a little bit? I was just noting that it says like, for, if I go, let me scroll back up here. So when we were talking about attendance, it says overall 13.3% for 1920 school year. Does that mean overall that's how many kids were absent? Overall, that's how many kids were in attendance? Like, I, and then underneath that, it's, or that's for ant chronic absenteeism. And then under attendance, it's like 95.1%. So is that on an average day, 95.1% of students were present? Like, I'm just trying to figure that out because then it, when you break it down by um, the different um, categories for like African-American, it's 93%. Does that mean 93% of the African-American students were present um, on, on an average day? Or is it 93% of African-Americans were absent? Like, I'm trying to figure out like what that exactly means. Great, great question. And then there's other parts where <coughs> it'll say, um, like the same thing for the percentage rate. Like, does that mean that's how many a percentage of students that were absent on an average day, and an average week? Like, I just, more specifics I feel like are needed in order to like really evaluate the data. Mm -hmm. <sighs> And then when you're looking at like the cast step, it says um, overall 66.81% for grade 11. Um, does that mean they were, there were 66.8% of students were at grade level, 66.81% were below grade level? Like what does that 66.81% represent? 
<clears throat> and I just want to jump in on the the CASP um, under the metric, and it's hard. Um, John and Laura, my recommendation would that we would uh, make sure the page numbers are on the attachments, mm -hmm. so it's easier to reference next time. But in goal three for English language arts state assessment. It says the percentage of students who meet or exceed the standards as measured by CASP. So it, it is they're either meeting standard or they're exceeding it um, on, on the CASP. So sometimes those answers are, are in the language of the metric, but it's a really um, big document. So it's hard to see all that. I guess on the I'll kind of on the same topic on the English language arts state assessment, I would I'm noticing all the numbers are low, very low. And I'm wondering how we can improve that. Is there a specific year, Steve, that you're looking at that's drawing your attention? 2018, 2019, which is pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really, I mean, again, grade 11 only for 2021 is not really getting a full picture because they already received pre-COVID instruction and with homeschool and some, uh, <clears throat> some accommodations probably not being in school mm -hmm. um, would to me makes makes that higher number uh, explains why that number is higher than uh, previous years i think Did you say it was for ela you're saying yeah, english language arts state assessment yes <clears throat> Um, to sort of like uh, Melissa's point, I, I do notice that it probably helps because I do notice in the lower right hand corner of each page, there is a page number. So sometimes following along because like uh, queer technical education might be listed in various forms on different pages. So to help other people follow along what you're actually looking at on which page, it might help to reference the page number that's in the lower right hand corner. Thanks for that, Tom. I, for some reason, it didn't print on my copy, so I appreciate you noticing that. Uh, this is kind of a, a wondering. Um, we, with the impact of um, COVID, that it it's you know those years are different for different students. So, uh, I mean, different grade levels. So, um, at certain grades, probably you know the early elementary grades where they're just learning to read and learning to write, the effects of not getting as uh, a deep education as they would have normally, my guess is that will continue to, you know, have its effects noticed for, for years. So that uh, in, I guess in the future, uh, you know, a certain grade levels, would there be an expectation of this grade level was, um, <coughs> with COVID at a time that was sort of critical for them to learn reading or for them to learn writing. Therefore, we will need to offer more I don't know, remedial classes for reading at the, for that grade level in future years and more remedial classes for writing it and uh, in, in, you know, in a year or two. So uh, just, just how, how, how that might actually play out in, in the future to try to um, make adjustments. Can I ask a question? Might be a wondering. Um, I know there's been a lot of um, data and research recently released within the last like six months or so regarding um, 
common curriculums found in schools and um, them not being aligned with science of reading and um, data-driven um, practices to build those reading and literacy skills. Has that been a topic that's been discussed and have we looked to see if the curriculum that's currently being used is the curriculum that was kind of outed as not being scientifically aligned and is the district or board considering new um, updated curriculums that are scientifically aligned um, to promote better literacy programs and also training for teachers, especially in those TK to second grade band. Perfect, I just wanna take a second here and just go back. Um, so Tom, what I heard you say is that you're wondering was, you were interested in knowing what the impact of COVID-19 is on our younger students um, learning to read their, their literacy skills, right. essentially. And then, and then April, what I'm hearing you say is you have a question about curriculum and you're wondering is if um, uh, how San Juan's curriculum is aligned to content standards no. no. How is the curriculum aligned to the um, scientific research that's come out within the last six months in regards to common curriculum that is used in a lot of districts like the Fountas and Pinnell and stuff like that that we see, or the Houghton Mifflin that we see, and how there are those curriculums are not supported with the science and data of building literacy skills. And are those the curriculums that we're currently using? And are we looking at replacing them because they're scientifically not good because they're not aligned with how kids learn to read? Does that make sense? Yes, um, I characterize that, yeah. I'm not sure. I put how is curri curriculum aligned to scientific methods and I wasn't sure after that. I think what she was saying <laughs> in terms of how is it aligned to the current research and specifically need, meeting the learning needs of students. Yeah, specifically with um, literacy and building yeah. those skills. Mm -hmm. Yes. To piggyback on that with CTE, with the pandemic, what Tom said, because a lot of kids that had CTE before, with before the pandemic, they were allowed to do certain things. This is say um, my my daughter's friends. They had culinary, and they were allowed to do a lot of things in culinary, like what, cooking. like cooking skills and, and everything else. But when the pandemic came on and coming back to school they were limited and they were pissed. And so I don't think, um, like how Tom said, piggyback with, with the English, with the literacy, we need, to, we need to add in the CTE skills for the high schoolers okay. as well. I wanted to throw that out to you because I, I, I overheard that while I was cooking. All right, so Steffi, I'm hearing you, you're making a, a recommendation or a consideration. So we'll, we'll note that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I don't want to forget that out with the high schoolers with the CTE because, okay. yeah, they're limited on what they can do after the pandemic. Perfect. And so as we continue, um, and we're getting close to time here, but we still have a few more minutes. Is there yeah, I have another thought. Yes, yeah, Steve, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so there, I, just uh, as we're talking about this, it reminded me of that there is one study where distance learning was used first, and it's been done before, and there's actually documentation on the effects of distance learning, and it was right after Hurricane Katrina. So there is data, and so I guess I'm noticing that we're kind of uh, discussing this these things, but I'm also wondering if the district's looking at the data from the Hurricane Katrina study where there was already distance learning done and the impact that that had on that entire generation mm -hmm. in a small group and in, in one state or a couple of states, but specifically the in states impacted by Hurricane Katrina, there is there's well-documented data on the impact of those children. Mm -hmm. And we could learn from that. Yeah, we, we did look at that right when we started the pandemic. And I think what we're, we're seeing is that we've been in this so long that um, the impact is going to be lasting. And so um, we will be working on the gaps that have been produced as a result of this and the impacts um, for many years to come. So um, I'm hoping that the board's aware of kind of what Tom was saying. This depends on what grade you were in. It depends on where you were on many levels when that occurred. 
Agreed that, you know, I, uh, let me just give a quick scenario and I don't want to take away time if somebody's got another noticing, but a quick scenario in terms of the district's response to how this has impacted particular grade levels. In the past, we've always, we have had a Camp Kinder, which is a summer um, kind of a kickstart program for um, kids that are entering kindergarten, and it gives them an opportunity to kind of learn how school is, and it specifically targets students who have, uh, or children who have had no pr previous preschool experience. And so we implemented that program as a way to kind of bridge and help support that transition into kindergarten. And what we did this past summer, because we recognized that even our kindergartners who participated in a full year distance learning, they still not, had not yet had that experience of how we do in school. So we had a K-1 boost a camp that was also focused on transitioning students into school and kind of teaching them how school is in person with the idea of starting back in um, to in-person learning. So those are two things that we're gonna be continuing this next summer, um, really specifically focusing on those um, transitional grades. Our um, middle and high also attended to, they, they did more intentional work around sixth and seventh graders because the seventh graders had not yet experienced middle school. Um, because they were in distance learning and then the same thing for ninth and 10th graders. So um, it's a really very solid point and it's, it's been something that we've been working towards to try to bridge that. Um, on that note of the summer programs, like my son, he's in special education. And so the summer like camp programs were, is the only opportunity he's ever going to have to participate in elective type classes. And I wish that there was a way without, I don't wanna say like give special ed kids a priority, but like that's gonna be their only opportunity to ever experience electives because the rest of their day is in special ed classes. And then I had to fight with the principal over getting him a para for the summer for his classes. I'm like, this is the only opportunity he's ever gonna have. And I just wish that process was more smooth and that he could actually get into the classes he wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little bit frustrating for our special ed population. I don't know if that happened with any other students, but my experience was frustrating around that. Um, Thank you for sharing that, April. That's really important feedback. And I do agree well, with you, April. Well, I just wanna make sure we're capturing that as a, as a consideration, correct? Yeah, um, April, I said wishes the processes are smoother and how you said something. What was the second part of that? I, maybe they can rank their desire for like the classes they want. And then when they're looking at the special ed students, like, you know, maybe they don't get their first option every time, but they're not always stuck with their last option for each section. Does that make sense? Because he was often just like, lumped into the last section, which isn't what he really wanted. April, if I heard you correctly, it was about this idea that um, in the summertime, that's when your child is able to take their electives. That's the, his only opportunity to engage in elective type classes because yes. you know he's in special ed classes or he has to take his core classes and he doesn't get it enroll in an elective class during the school year because he's in special ed. And so, so that's his only opportunity to do something fun and like, yes, there's academic components to it, but it's like a choice of something that's interesting to him. Like he wanted, he really wants to learn about banking and checking accounts and stuff. And there was a financial literacy one and he was hyped to do it. And he didn't get into the class because it was full. And he wound up getting into another class. And then he was like, I really don't want to do that. So he didn't go. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, that kind of sucks because especially for our special ed kids, financial literacy and being able to manage a checking account is a life skill and it's really important that they learn that mm -hmm. so I agree that that was frustrating and then when there were classes that he was excited to go to and he got into then there was a whole nother piece of well is he going to have his paraeducator support and I had to go back and forth with the principal on that and it just I wish that part was smoother mm -hmm. so April and when you're saying you wish this part were smoother are you talking about for summer school or for it's for those, the, the summer classes that okay. were offered. Yeah, those like okay. summer camp classes that were offered last summer. Got it. Yeah. 
that's not offered to special ed students during the school year at all. Well, right, because he's in special ed classes, so he can't take electives during right. the school year. Mm -hmm. And that's his only opportunity. My nephew's autistic, and it took him until he was about late teens, early 20s to be able to go to in and out by himself. And it's that's important. I would I would double I would I would totally concur. So folks, I want to be um, respectful of time this evening. So just a few things as we, we close this evening. One, uh, y'all did an amazing job. <laughs> this is a really challenging to be able to look at this data, make the observations and the questions. So I just want to thank you all um, for just engaging in this process and doing such a wonderful job. And I can't wait for us to be able to do this again in future meetings. Two, I also know that you might have, as you look at this data a little bit more, you might find some additional noticings and you might have some additional wonderings. And if you do, um, you, uh, Laura had provided you with that note catcher essentially to make some noticings and wonderings. So feel free to add to that. And if you wanna include it, just send it to uh, Laura and we will include it in this information. And then finally, I might just add that um, uh, this might be after this conversation, it might, um, uh, be worth considering to review some of the actions that are currently uh, in place for our LCAP, because you might notice that some of the observations we made, there might be some programs and services and strategies that we are currently implementing, and it might provide some food for thought in terms of some types of uh, adjustments that we might want to make to our current actions in order to improve um, outcomes for our English learner, um, foster youth, low income and homeless students as well. So I just want to commend you all on this evening and, and um, I guess with that, I am now going to turn it over to uh, Kim and Laura, who are going to take us to our attendance and roll call. Thank you. Thanks, At Kim. This, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that. It was good. Um, so at this time, we're going to take attendance. So if Laura, if you could take attendance. Sure. All right, I'm going to do a verbal Roll call of attendance and just tell me yes if you're here. So we have Kim. Kim? Yes. Amber? Yes. Elnoria? Stephanie? We both said yes. My mom's also cooking dinner. So. Okay. All righty. Um, thank you. April? Elizabeth? Yes. Chelsea? Serena? Zena? See. Oh, Zena, you're on mute. I'll take it that you're here. Tom? Here. Neelam? Yes. <laughs> Natalie? Here. And Steve? Present. Actually, I should probably say Jacqueline too, just in case I missed her. Okay. And then Serena, do you want to come off mute and tell us you're here? Um, oh, Serena isn't here. You're right. Oh, I was talking about Zena. Zena, yeah. Okay. Okay, we have 11 people in attendance, so we have quorum. Awesome. Um, I would like to motion to approve the minutes unless there are any corrections necessary. Uh, see, I have a couple of things that I um, would like to add to the minutes that I think were omitted. Um, and I, uh, I talked to Serena, she, uh, she's at mock trial, but uh, did exchange some email with her. So uh, in the minutes under the uh, real equity portion, mm -hmm. uh, like the, the uh, it uh, added that the student representative shared that the Rio equity committee has been full of action because they have subcommittees. Is that me, Bert? It's Tom, what did you say? The student representative at Rio Equity? Yeah, the student rep oh. representative shared. Or, yeah. Um, can you please mute your, um, your mic, please? Go ahead, Tom. OK. Uh, the student representative shared their Rio Equity Committee has been full of action because they have subcommittees has been full of actions okay. I can, because they have multiple. Yeah, I, I put it in the chat if that helps. Yeah, go ahead. I can pick that up after. And then the second item was that the uh, 
student representative stated that most of the general um, Rio student population was not involved in selecting their student representatives on site council. So I'd like, yeah, let's see, I like those two was. Um, added into the minutes. And then there's um, a, a third uh, item that I would like uh, to have actually removed from the minutes. And that is that uh, the, I propose that the, um, the indicators of I, D, and A, that those items be removed um, from the minutes. Uh, those indicators have confused some of our committee members and even some uh, staff administrators have had the false belief that our committee cannot take action or discuss items on the agenda unless they had those indicators on it. So, I mean, the truth is our committee can discuss or take action on any item listed on the agenda. So I think those uh, indicators should be removed from, from the minutes. Yeah, I think we may need to look at that because in our bylaws, it states that we have to, before we can take action, we have to have something agendized on the agenda. So we're gonna have to look at that, Tom, if I'm understanding you correctly. No, they are on the agenda. Yeah. So you're just the, saying in the minutes you want those removed. Yes. Okay. From the, from the minutes, yeah. They're, they're, okay. they, um, those indicators are not put into board minutes. <clears throat> put on to the in the minutes of other committees so okay okay though uh, so just those three items and right and then can you ref um, tell me the student representative stated that the gen ed population at rio were did not what were they, that they were not uh, the the um, most of the rio student body was was not involved in the process of uh, selecting their student representatives okay. on school site council. Um, I think I put, I also put that statement uh, right. that I, I ran past Serena since she was the one that, that uh, made it at our last meeting. Okay, got it, thank you. I think I had it right, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay. So I'd make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Eve Rubens, second. Okay, okay. If there are no other corrections oh. needed. Oh, Kim, can I do a just a, a real quick roll Kim, call of the take okay. okay? So let um, me do a quick roll call of people of everyone that approves the minutes with the uh, with the corrections or additions. So Kim. Yes. Amber? Abstain. El Noria? Stephanie? Okay. Are you guys there? Helnoria, Stephanie? Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, the computer's being slow. What did you guys say again? Uh, do you approve the minutes with amendments? Yes, we both do. April? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Zena, can you come off? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Perfect. Thanks, Zena. Tom? Yes. Neelam? Yes. Natalie? Yes. And Steve? Yes. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so minutes approved with 10 yeses and one abstention. Thank you, Laura. And okay. um, can we also um, kind of go back a little to see if there are any comments for the LCAT mid-year update from visitors? Yes, that would be the, yes, thank you. That would be the next, yeah, thank you, Kim. So at this point in time, um, if we have any visitors that would like to make a comment or ask a question regarding what we just covered with the mid-year update, you mm -hmm. now is your time. So please come off mute if you're a visitor. Um, um, pack member. Yeah, we have no, yeah, we have no visitors at this point in time making a comment, but Tom, you have your hand raised? Uh, yes. 
Um, I see on one of the slides that mentioned uh, differentiated assistance. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that we have a couple of student groups that have been on differentiated assistance for three or, or more years. And differentiated assistance is a tiered um, system uh, where the third tier is intensive intervention. So I believe we have two student groups that have been designated by the California Department of Education as being in that third tier of intensive intervention. And I, I would like uh, an explanation of what the process is of intensive intervention. Um, so if we go and we looked at uh, the, the, the slide, which we were talking about differentiated assistance, that intensive intervention, there's a requirement uh, when two student groups, um, according to the California dashboard, are um, meeting in the red indicator for a performance indicator on the dashboard for three or more years, we are required to write an LCAP goal, an additional LCAP goal, which is what we, I shared in the presentation. Okay. So that's the, that is the next step is that we will write an additional goal for our students um, who are foster youth and who are receiving special education services um, with the focus on graduation rate and college and career readiness. Okay. All right. Thank you for that, for that uh, information and that clarification. I appreciate that. Of course, Tom. Thank you. All right. Okay. Kim, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. At this time, we have an awesome guest speaker who will be sharing about equity, diversity, and why representation matters in the educational system. She's a former high school teacher who taught nearly 20 years in the traditional classroom. She is the founder CEO of Ascribe Educational Consulting, a local equity firm likened to DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, specializing in curating safe, brave space for courageous conversations about race and white supremacy. She is a social justice advocate and uses her nonprofit um, Edify Humanity for community advocacy with respect to equity and resources. She is a former chapter lead of the Black Lives Matter Sacramento who helped write two state legislations that are now state laws around police accounting, a city ordinance for SAC PD campaign with decarceration Sacramento to stop jail expansion and mobilize massive demonstrations around the country. As a community activist, she successfully sued Sheriff Scott Jones for a violation of her First Amendment rights and won the lawsuit. Sonia Lewis has been described as fearless and unflinching, driven by her integrity. I would like to welcome our special guest, Sonia Lewis. She will speak, and when she is done, you can ask questions in the chat or by raising your hand, and Steve will call on each person. So welcome, Sonia Lewis. Thank you so much, um, Kim, for that um, introduction. I, um, it's an honor to be in spaces like this, having these challenging conversations um, at a time that is extremely critical and crucial. Um, it is beyond time that we address the big elephants that continue to be in the rooms and we continue to ignore collectively as a society. Um, I wanna start off by just acknowledging two things. I always start off anytime that I'm asked to speak to just acknowledge the land that we are on and that land being stolen land of the Miwok and the Maidu um, and the Pat Patwin um, here in the California region. I also wanna acknowledge the labor of Africans who were stole and enslaved that built this country. And so beyond the land acknowledgement, we have to also acknowledge those who built this country. And that's very appropriate since we are in Black History Month and the topic of today's conversation, or at least what I was asked to talk about is representation. I do realize based on the information and data and demographics of San Juan Unified School District that there is a small um, population of Black um, students within your um, district. But I want to tell you this, um, it is extremely important to lift from wherever the most disenfranchised are, wherever the most vulnerable are, wherever the most targeted are. And if you are having issues with a specific demographic of students, those are the students that you will, um, if you are able to successfully impact their educational experiences, you will positively impact the educational experiences of all students. And so I wanna just share a few things. Um, first off, I wanna use a quote by Imani Blair, who is from the state of New York. Um, 
thank you so much, Kim, for sharing that the links and things in, in the um, chat. Um, Imani Blair, who I sat on a panel with several years ago for a women's march, the National Women's March. Um, and she said, if black students can experience racism, then white students can learn about it. And I really and truly believe that is the crux of the discussion, um, because it's not a matter of um, people being afraid of CRT, critical race theory, it is a matter of American history being erased from and narrated in a way that only exemplifies um, the white lived experience and or the male lived experience. Let me be very specific about that. I also want to say um, that the American experience, because it has included um, such a diverse population, um, I wanna use the example of Ruby Bridges. And in this area of Sacramento alone, Ruby Bridges is taught just over the top. And we love Ruby Bridges. She is shy of 70 years old. She's still alive today. But imagine the people who were alive then who were heckling and throwing um, rocks and, and water bottles and um, um, racial epithets at a five-year-old trying to get an education in um, New Orleans when she was entering kindergarten. Those are the very same people who are afraid of their grandchildren and great-grandchildren learning that they were present when they were heckling and throwing those racial epithets at a Ruby Bridges five-year-old who didn't have power to say, this is what I need in the classroom. And so she was one part of the story that never gets talked about. There was one white student, um, white teacher, I'm sorry, from the city of um, Boston in Massachusetts who volunteered to come down to New Orleans to be Ruby Bridges' teacher. Her entire kindergarten year, she was the only student in that class because the rest of the families who were attending that school in New Orleans refused to have their children in class with one black child. I say that and I want to lead to, because I always try to connect the dots, I lead to the fact that law enforcement was never involved in our um, educational system until the integration of Black students into the public school system. So when Black bodies are now integrated into schools that are deemed typically white, districts that are deemed typically white by majority or dominant culture, then we have to bring law enforcement. And so what message does that send a black child that now you need police here to protect property? When, if you know the history of law enforcement, the history of law enforcement is that they were born out of slavery. And that birth was that they were slave catchers. And in being slave catchers, they were their job was to catch slaves who were property. And so connect the dots. You're now bringing in law enforcement into the school public school system to protect property from black people who weren't given the right to um, integrated schools nor the right to vote. So that's just a little bit of background. And let me also just say that um, I have a degree in history and psychology from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, which is the number one HBCU um, in this country. Um, I also was accepted into Stanford and Berkeley. I share that because my high school um, um, advisor told me that I was guilty of reverse racism because I chose to attend an HBCU. That was a lot, so I have to take a breath, right? The importance of representation are the, more than twofold, right? This isn't just about Black students and bringing in Black teachers and, and um, administrators and counselors. This is about impacting all students. Study out of Stanford says that Black teachers impact white students more than they do Black students. I'm reading um, from the Atlantic, which this article was presented um, August 6, 2015. It says Noah Caruso, 17 year, years old, South Philly, he calls his home, known for cheesecake, pizza, and bakeries. I'm going to skip down to um, when he enrolled in high school. His entire educational career, he attended um, nearly all white schools within his school district. Then he was accepted into a science leadership academy, a public magnet high school in the city. And it landed him his freshman year, the first time ever to have a black teacher. His first teacher, that teacher name was Mr. K. He said he was the most inspiring teacher I had by far. Caruso said, recalling K's emphasis and contemporary thought topics um, such as present day racism. 
he definitely pushed us to think critically about these social issues that weren't talked about before in my entire life, not even at home, because everyone grew up in this area. And he continued to say, we are all white and everyone had the same opinion of Mr. K, that he was a positive force um, on our campus. That's one article. I also want to share um, from Ed Weekly, which is our educational weekly magazine that comes out. Um, and this is from February 20th, 2018, The Importance of White Students Having Black Teachers um, by Gloria Ladson Billingsley, Billings um, on Education. And she says, um, this isn't necessarily about Black students when it comes to the impact of Black teachers. The full scope of things is that teachers of color did make the crisis of racism disappear because white students have a level of respect. So what if we had more black teachers? Almost every conversation around the remedy for black and white ac academic achievement disparities includes a recommendation for the recruitment and retaining of more black teachers. And so as a former black teacher, I can tell you a couple of things because I spent almost 20 years in the traditional classroom. And that 20 years in the traditional classroom, I will tell you that my labor beyond the scope of being a teacher was abused and manipulated. And so there's no wonder that I felt the stress, um, the anxiety, as well as the um, a state of um, depression that I suffered near the end of my career because the school district that I was working for, Sac City Unified at the time, um, was overburdening my capacity to even be impactful in the classroom because there were so many other expectations of me as a black educator within the district. Another um, article that I wanted to reference, this comes from the Washington Post. It is titled, Why Black Teachers Matter to Black and White Kids. And so this article um, was presented August 29, 2020 by Valerie Strauss. And she says, 15 years ago, when Hurricane Katrina swept into Louisiana from the Gulf of Mexico and decimated the port of New Orleans, included a long troubled school system. What rose in its place was a collection of charter schools that appeared very different from the district that preceded it. School reformers who supported charter schools, which are publicly funded but privately operated, held the changes and pointed to the rise in standardized testing based on the presence of more Black teachers. And so that's another, yet another example. Um, and I like to use examples because um, the data doesn't lie. Another important article that um, was that came out of giving the Giving Compass, um, and it's titled Five Ways Black Teachers Benefit Black Students. This was written August 17, 2018. And it says, reason number one, Black students benefit, although the magnitude of the effective, uh, of the effects can differ, new, numerous research indicates that there's a question of racial matching, a pairing of giving students with a teacher of the same racial ethnic background points to the same conclusion. All things being equal, black students do better when they have and are taught by black teachers. Reason number two, it's about more than testing scores. For a long time um, impact and racial matching, there is no research that is striking to the study of North Carolina students um, circulated last year by Seth Greensburg, Cassandra Hart, and Constant Lindsay in the findings that gained headlines around the country. Though it hasn't been validated by peer review, the group reported that exposure to just one Black teacher between eight grades three and five significantly reduces high school dropout rates among Black students, particularly Black male students. Reason number three, why does matching work? The need for role models um, is one answer. And so just the sheer presence is about role modeling. It exposes students to the reality of um, the possibilities of possibilities that we can be anything in this world. And if there is no exposure, if there are no role models, if there is no representation, then what do Black students leave your, your school doors and campuses believing about themselves? Reason four. Another reason is the expectations matter. Oftentimes, 
and, and this is not a knock against any teacher who has good intentions to teach all students who come into their classroom, but there's this preconceived notion, there are implicit biases, there are blind spots that prevent oftentimes, not all times, but oftentimes white student, white teachers for, for having higher expectations of black students. And so the hypothesis is that there's this power of expectation and how they differ amongst racial group, groups. And so multiple studies have suggested that white teachers simply have lower expectations of black students than they do of white students. And case in point, because I'm a former member with Black Lives Matter Sacramento, when I was with the chapter, I had myself and our entire chapter had several conversations with not just high school students um, within San Juan Unified School District, but as well as um, school personnel with respects to incidences at not just Encina High School, um, Del Campo High School, Rio Americana High School, and El Camino High School. I can remember there was a student who was ultimately um, the valedictorian, I believe, of Encina High School who started a Black Black um, student union chapter um, there at her high school um, fought hard to have their presence um, heard and felt on that campus and teachers on that campus didn't believe that she was in AP classes and this is a student who had above a 4.0 um, grade point average and was excelling ex very high and was slated to go to any Ivy League college in this country and she had white teachers on that campus who always asked her for her schedule to prove that she was in AP classes. Mm -hmm. reason, reason number five, matching also offers a unique window for school discipline, because this is what we know. Oftentimes, and again, this isn't a knock on the education system, but it is a reality check that oftentimes um, white counterparts and peers of black students, specifically black male students, behaving in the very same manner, don't have the same consequences. And so we have to examine those kind of things. And so um, I would just behoove those of you who are dealing with and, and considering what representation looks like to look at one, the history of integration in this country, um, liken it to the experience of Ruby Bridges. What would life had been like if Ruby as an adult didn't have to heal from the childhood trauma that she experienced because white adults were ushering her to school every day with racial epithets. Imagine the life that she could have lived. She has to relive those experiences on a continuous basis. And so as an equity expert um, with my business Ascribe Educational Consulting, I am oftentimes asked to speak on this topic, but I will tell you this, it is not limited to the experiences of behavior issues. It is not limited to the experiences of the mentorship and representation. It also goes beyond that. And I, I would be remiss if I did not say in Black History Month that a lot of the historically Black narratives that are shared are shared year after year. And not only do you disconnect Black students from even feeling prideful or connected or excited about Black History Month, you also do that to white, Indigenous, Latinx, um, Asian, um, all students because they're, they learn about the same five figures. And I'm sure you can name those five top um, black icons, Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Colin Powell, just to name a few, right? So mm -hmm. if they learn about those same people year after year and the school district isn't doing good do, due diligence to bring in other narratives into the story, students are not excited about learning about black history, which is American history. And then I'll leave you with this final thing. Um, and that is there should be an audit of not only all policies, but a challenge to the climate and culture on any school campus that allows for racist practices, um, implicit biases to manifest themselves in a negative way. Because one of my jobs or two of my jobs, I should say as an equity expert is to hopefully um, provide tools for organizations like San Juan. I work with the Robla um, School District. I will work with um, Rosemont High School and Sac City Unified School District, United Way, several organizations, corporate, nonprofit, and education. And here's the challenge that I give all people in education. Imagine a world 
where our young people can leave your school, your schools, not having to heal from their childhood traumas and specifically those childhood traumas associated with racism. So I liken myself to a debt collector because my ancestors, unfortunately, were forced to live through the traumas. I am in my 50s now. I was forced to live through these traumas. My oldest child is 27. He was, ex he was forced to live through these traumas. And I am, my expectation is that my youngest, who is eight years, nine years old, doesn't have to continue to live through these traumas experienced on school campuses around this country. Mm -hmm. um, the last resource that I want to share with you is this book um, regard in regards to Black Lives Matter at school. It is, when I was with Black Lives Matter, educators around this country got together to create curriculum so that no teacher across this country could have an excuse of why not to teach responsible, respectful, and intelligent curriculum about the Black lived experience. Today in the news, yesterday in the news, we heard about a preschool teacher teaching a lesson of, of Blackface, where she gave her pre, preschool students a paper plate, told them to draw a Blackface, and then put it on their faces. How inappropriate, how offensive. And the response from the school, this preschool, a monastery, monastery school, was to one, fire that teacher, but not look at the curriculum. They didn't blame the curriculum, they just said the curriculum wasn't taught well. And I call foul to that, because not only was that curriculum offensive, they shouldn't, the apology shouldn't be if someone was offended. There should never be an if or a but when someone is acknowledging harm that happens in community. And so I would just urge you all, if you are interested in um, decreasing suspension and expulsion rates and looking at equity across the board for this district to really take a look at representation. If you are wanting to have a social, um, emotional, culture and climate change at your, within your district, look at representation. If you are wanting to take steps forward that is inclusive, and inclusive doesn't just mean we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's and checking off the boxes that my teachers went through, my staff went through DEI um, training. No, this is really and truly about a culture and a mindset shift. And we have to teach children from age kindergarten about race. It is imperative that we start doing this now. And then finally, and I'll leave you with this, creating an anti-racist school learning environment is not just good for the students that leave your doors. It is good for their families. It is good for your community. And it is good working ethics for your working environment. And so that's what I would say um, in respects to why representation is important on any school campus. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. Lewis. That was wonderful. Does um, anyone have any questions for Sonia at this time? I know this is a hard conversation. Yeah. And so I'm sure that um, many people are uncomfortable, but it's okay to be uncomfortable for us to, for us to have these conversations to move he, forward. He Amber? Sure Sorry. Amber, you can come off of mute. Sure. I just, it sounded like someone else was going to hop in there. No, if they could raise their hand first. So go ahead, Amber. Okay. I was just, I really appreciate it. Son, can you, sorry. I don't know if you can hear him in the background. Um, I really appreciated your, uh, your opening and just kind of acknowledging San Juan and the um, sort of, for lack of better words, um, reputation that the district has for being a very white district and um, the very real experiences that our students have um, had, I particularly have been blown away by some of the things that I've heard at Rio Americano. Um, and I wonder, I guess, less, less focused on the students and more so about teachers. Um, I find that, you know, they're white fragility is real. And I think in schools, we, there's this very fine balance of wanting to present as a team and administration have the staff's back in a way that it comes across as 
um, being dismissive of the experience of black students and black families. And what do we do? <laughs> like, how do we get that to the surface of that needs to be a conversation that's addressed because it is impacting the culture and climate that is felt on campus for black children and also for their parents and we can't i'm sorry i <laughs> clearly it struck a nerve with me but like i just i don't under i i don't know what do we do about that um i've also been a vocal in previous meetings um about philosophies of some of the leaders in the school district how we've seen um the way that their school sites have played out and then being promoted to higher um, positions within the school district. And what message does that send? And how do how does that thinking sort of trickle down into the way that we're seeing things kind of play out for our students? Like, I don't know how to how to bring that up and, and bridge that when there's so much choice that's afforded to teachers and staff around what equity trainings they can or cannot participate in. Um, it's frustrating. So <laughs> it's extremely frustrating. And, and I just want to honor you in this moment for even um, having the courage to present this because these are experiences that sometimes get silenced and erased and um, ignored or othered, right? And so here are the, a couple of things that um, we have been seeing, especially post George Floyd. Unfortunately, I've been doing equity work um, in the Sacramento area for over a decade. And so while I've been talking the talk of we need to have culture and climate change on school campuses all across this county and state, um, here's the reality. We live in a very, what is what seems politically to be a very blue state, but we are really and truly guided and dictated by very red, red policies. And so that means it's time for every school board to up the ante and do an audit of policies and procedures within their district. That audit looks like seeing where the needs are being met, seeing where the gaps are, the real gaps, right? Because if we can identify the gaps, we can then create program. Anyone, I, I, I'm sure that the talent is there within this organization to create programs and curriculum around closing gaps. That's a no brainer for anyone who has a master's degree in education. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is groups like you. I also work closely with the um, LCAP PAC um, with Sac City Unified School District. I am on the uh, African-American advisory board um, for Sac City Unified School District. And so I think it's time that San Juan create an African-American advisory board. This is something that is becoming the norm across this country, um, that you are now going to listen to the voices, not only of parents and students, but of community members who are encouraged to and want to see the shifts and change within their school district. So that's the second thing, because that's taxpayer dollars at work. You can see it be at work. Um, I can tell you that every district is different. And how do I say this? So for example, my contract that I work and I, I'm into year two of a five-year commitment with Robla School District, which is a small elementary school district here in Sac County, right? Um, they have a little over 300 employees. The first year of our anti-racism resilience training, all staff at every level, all, not just teachers, not administrators, we're talking about cafeteria workers, bus drivers, hall monitors, all staff, if you got a paycheck from Robla School District, you are required to participate in a once a month anti-racism and resilience training um, led by myself and a professor that's at Sac State. Now, here's the thing, the data that came out of that, 78% of their staff, and we're talking about a little less than 300, 78% um, said that they would do it again. They would sign up for being forced to attend said trainings. Um, going into the second year, it's not mandatory, but those employees who get, who do participate, they have some incentives. And so districts have funding. And, and, and I don't want, um, San Juan is a resource rich district. It is one of the more resource rich districts in our county. And so you have to use that to your advantage as well. So if we are talking about who you're paying to come in to lead these trainings, 
making sure that they are not individuals outside of your area and don't understand, understand the scope of the local scheme of things. I think that is incredibly crucial. When you bring people in from the Bay Area or Los Angeles or um, across the country from Boston, like St. Francis did when they had their you know, racial um, debauchery that was brought to the public attention earlier this school year. They brought someone in from Boston, Massachusetts instead of organizations like myself. And that's not me saying that I should be given the job to work with certain schools that are here locally. It's just saying that you should pick people who are right in your backyard, who understand the dynamics of the culture of this um, region. Mm-hmm. Um, so that those are two things that I would highly recommend. Use this LCAP team to really dig deep on where the gaps are and then make those recommendations that lend to an an, uh, unservicing of an audit, so to speak, of where um, the gaps lie so that we can, we have to begin to manifest real change for students who are the most disenfranchised. Thank you. Um, April, if you'd like to share or ask your question. I just wanted to ask for her resources, but it looked like someone put them in the chat. And then also you had mentioned a curriculum or something. I was wondering if you could share information on that. We recently had my son's IEP meeting and I always have my son because I'm trying to teach him um, self-advocacy and stuff of any concerns that he has. And his number one concern was the racism on campus and people using the N-word and things like that. So it's, it's documented in his IEP. So I'm like, if we have like good recommendations on stuff that the school can use to start implementing, like that kind of information, I'd like to be able to share it. Absolutely. I'm putting the name of the book. It is an uprising for educational justice, um, Black Lives Matter at school. And um, it's not the only resource. You can Google Black Lives Matter at school. It is a curriculum. It is very robust that has curriculum from K to postgraduate. And so there's never an excuse. Um, I will say that my chapter in particular here in Sacramento of the chapter members, and we were probably at our height, probably about 40 members. I would say that 60% of us had a bachelor's degree. I would say that 30% of us had a master's degree and 20% of us had a PhD. So this notion that Black Lives Matter are a bunch of um, well, welfare recipients, uneducated Black women who have nothing better to do than stop traffic. Oh, we like stopping traffic because it reminds folks that you know someone may have lost their life or a student at a school may have been expelled for something um, that is ridiculous that re- doesn't require an expulsion. And so while it's important to know that an, a disruption is crucial to the movement, um, it's also important to note that attending school board meetings is important and that challenging um, school board electees, right? Because they are elected officials that they could potentially be replaced. And so if that's a matter of a black a, a African-American advisory board being organized within this district, and then determining who could be potential candidates to run for specific offices to represent the school board, and then putting some, you know, really some good groundwork, um, grassroots effort behind those campaigns, that can be major shifts within a district. I've seen it happen. We are waiting on it to happen in Elk Grove. That's where my kids attend school, but I've been seeing it happen and play out across the state over the past few years. I just have one thing to note, and then Tom, you'll be our um, our, our, our last um, one to ask a question from Sonia. I wanted to note that as we look through the LCAP metrics and outcome data this evening, um, that um, in five out of eight of the disparity areas um, are African-American students. So you'll find them having some of the greatest disparities throughout um, all of our, our data, but but they're also within uh, socially economically disadvantaged, special education, foster youth, and homeless youth, and and and, um, and our homeless youth. So we really have to take a a serious look at our African American students. Absolutely. Tom? Take yourself off the of mute, Tom. Oh, thank you. 
Okay, yeah, um, I'm glad that you referenced the um, LCAP uh, metrics and outcomes data because on uh, page two of that document, we do have uh, staffing ethnic diversity. And this is probably more of a question for, for uh, staff. Uh, I appreciate the, the uh, idea of you know, uh, um, connecting locally for the expertise of what's needed for ethnic diversity. So I guess my question is, have uh, teachers in the San Juan School District that are Black teachers, that are teachers of color, have, they, have we connected with them to ask them what would make San Juan a more attractive or what they could do to help attract more uh, teachers of color, more Black teachers? to increase and to move that metric to increase the uh, diversity so it comes closer to matching the student diversity? I love that question and the direction that you're going, Tom. It's crucial. Um, one, of the, one of the tools and techniques that we use in this equity work is we do affinity grouping. And within an affinity group, folks who feel comfortable speaking about the same issues that impact them on a social emotional level when they come into their working environment um, kind of demystifies the harm or trauma that they, they might be experiencing. And so gathering individuals who are um, in the African diaspora, be them Black, African-American, or immigrant, right? Um, those experiences, those um, opinions and voices are valuable. And so it would behoove you not to tap on the talent that already exists within your district. Um, and the way that I see some of those things playing out is, you know, Black folks love to congregate around food, you know, and that's, I'm talking about the cultural norms of who we are as people, right? I mean, uh, and, and that's just not that's just not black culture. I'm just saying if you're going to have a meeting and you're going to expect um, for black folks to show up after hours and you know to give some extra work, there has to be some incentive in it. It's are it's challenging enough showing up to work in white spaces where you, it's not a lot of you on a regular basis to then not have you know some comfort to that that gathering. And so I, I say that, you know, not to, you know, not as a jab to who we are culturally. Um, and, and, and other cultures have that as the same food is food is something that, you know, we all love. Okay. Um, but in, in having these meetings, there also has to be a sense of trust that this is not going to be something that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. Because um, Black women in particular, we can see BS coming and going and we can say, oh, this is this new thing that they're doing. And you're going to call on me for my labor. I'm going to give you my labor. You're going to tuck it away and put it into a nice written up report. And it's going to sit on the shelf. And then you're going to report out to the district at a, a district school board meeting. And it's going to say, oh, we have these gaps and we need to do this. And nothing gets done. And that is emotional labor. And I say that not only is it emotional labor, it is violent labor. It is expecting someone to show up for you and you don't show up for them. And that causes stress, that causes anxiety, that causes all of the mental um, and emotional health crises. We saw, we've seen it firsthand during COVID where mental health and self-care have been highly talked about during this time period. And I would just say that if you're going to do something to tread lightly and make sure that you have folks that they trust in the room to make sure that it is handed off in a way that, you know, that there's some trust that's there. It requires some relationship building. Yes, I agree. Well, at this time, I want to thank you, Sonia Lewis, uh, for just coming, sharing with us, um, uh, exposing the elephant in the room. Um, for us, this is this is the beginning, um, and we will um, take all the information that you shared, and we are going to have further discussion about it. And we hope uh, that you'll come back again um, after we've kind of digested some of this information and. Um, figure out how we might want to utilize it. Um, but we really appreciate you for, for coming into our space and sharing your wealth of experience. Absolutely. It's my honor. Um, let me know. I'm here and I'm available. Thank you so much. All right. So um, at this time, we're going to move on to our uh, committee business.
if you could pull it up, Laura. And Sonia has put all her contact information in, in, the, um, in the chat, so if you'd like to grab it. Okay, so we have a few updates. Uh, I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. It went black, what happened? Okay, uh, so the bylaw concerning student chairperson elections was adopted at the January 25th uh, board meeting. Can everyone hear me? Or am I, am I um, stuck? I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I can hear you. You're Thank cutting you. out a little bit, but you're back. All right, perfect, thanks. Um, uh, PAC membership, uh, two members have resigned, uh, two potentially may be leaving. And so we really need to uh, start working on our uh, recruiting efforts. And um, the, la the last thing on the updates is that we heard your voice uh, with, um, of how we could improve our meetings and what we're doing well as, uh, as well. So our um, discussion tonight will be around, and it's going to be pretty short. If we don't get through with everything, um, then it'll go out. The rest of it will go on the email uh, for everyone to follow up. So connected school uh, subcommittee was newly formed by Steve and Tom. Um, so if you'd like to join it, please connect with them. If you want to, after this meeting has closed, uh, Steve and Tom uh, have said that they would wait afterwards to discuss uh, the connected school subcommittee with anyone who's interested in joining. Um, our top three priorities we heard from you were parent engagement, social and emotional support, and organizing subcommittees. And our future um, agenda items, we'll discuss those. If anyone has any uh, agenda items that they would like to include as we move forward. And then uh, the last thing is how LCAP PAC members can help outside of our regularly scheduled meetings and our next meeting. Can you go to the next slide, please? So PAC membership, uh, the application is online. If you know of anyone uh, that you think would be a great fit in our LCAP PAC, if you could please just uh, shoot them that link and ask them to consider joining our PAC. Next slide. And this was your voice here. Uh, I loved what uh, someone had to say. I don't know if it was a visitor or if it was one of our PAC members, but they said set expectations that every member needs to share something at each meeting, defining that something to be broad enough that everyone can contribute and narrow enough to be meaningful to LCAP. And, I, and I would, I'm gonna post that at our next meeting and our next meeting before we even start the meeting, just to encourage and inspire everyone on our PAC that your voice matters and that we would like to hear from you. Um, so ways to improve our meetings. Uh, one was that they said that they didn't like late ads or ambiguous questions that were kind of confusing and um, that uh, they wanted us to submit PAC questions, uh, wanted to be able to submit PAC questions prior to the meeting. Um, they want increased opportunities in sharing and learning, which is something we've been constantly trying to do. And hopefully we're getting better at that with relevant data and qualitative data, uh, which is an area in which we, we definitely need improvement. And purposeful presentations, I believe tonight was a very purposeful, purposeful presentation. Um, time to ask questions and meet in person. Um, someone had mentioned time consideration that if we could split the presentation, sometimes when there's too much information, if we could split that presentation up until another meeting. And that's where our subcommittees would come in to play. Um, and then uh, in the chat questions, uh, the individual monitoring this evening was our very own Steve. And so that was because you said we needed to improve in that area. And so now we're taking answers and questions in order and, and doing a better job at monitoring our chat. And of course, the things we got right, we'd love to hear that, or our breakout rooms, which are always a great success. Um, tonight, uh, we didn't do it. We were, we were intending to, but it seemed to work out better being in, in a full group uh, with um, having to look at so much data that everyone was not too clear on how to answer all of the questions. And then new information, as we provided tonight and meeting preparation. So we hope that we're still continuing to, to do those things. And uh, someone had said, I felt more open to discuss and have my voice heard. So we just love to hear that. Next slide. 
So our Connected Schools Committee, which was uh, formed by Stephen Tom, um, is about under parent is about parent engagement, pupil engagement, and school climate. So if you're interested, please join and contact Steve at srubis at gmail.com. And here are our top uh, three future agenda items. They are parent engagement, social and emotional supports, and organizing subcommittees. Um, this was based off of everyone who had responded. We're not limited to these three top air agenda items, but these are the three that were voted on that had the most votes. And so we would like to begin here. Next slide. And our uh, future agenda items, um, these are two that I put on the agenda, but I encourage all of our PAC members to add to these agenda items. And one is representation district and school wide uh, for staffing, curriculum, um, media platforms, social clubs, academic clubs, images throughout school sites, uh, within groups, committees, and forums, is that there's representation um, specifically for African-American families, but also for all other um, English language learners, uh, representation for um, our uh, homeless youth, representation uh, for um, our uh, foster youth, and also for our special ed students, because representation looks different in all of those groups. And then the the second one was uh, support uh, learning. Recently, I found out that LCAP PAC does not have discretionary funds. We have no money to do anything within our LCAP PAC other than when we make recommendations. And so I would like for us to discuss making a recommendation for support learning for LCAP members for training, workshops, visiting muse museums and historical sites and communication tools that will make us a more impactful and effective LCAP PAC. So uh, please, uh, any future agenda items, just put it in the chat before you leave or email it to Steve. Next. And we have about one minute left. So um, how LCAP PAC members can help outside of regularly scheduled meetings, volunteer, join or start an LCAP PAC subcommittee, recruit other PAC members and reach out and report back to our team by uh, um, speaking with your principal, um, uh, visiting some of the school site councils and other uh, clubs and organizations and committees and reporting that back to us. Next slide. And if we have any general visitor comments, we'll take those at this time. Okay. Yep, yep I think we're okay, good to go. So I think we're done uh, for this evening. I wanna thank everyone for your time. Uh, for your hard work this this evening this was definitely a working meeting and we got a lot of work done we still have so much more work to do um, i would like to encourage everyone that prior to meetings please look at the information that we send out please come prepared can we have uh april has got her hand raised april would you like to there you go at our last meeting i had asked about um it was brought up like volunteering on like the school campuses and I don't remember who the representative from the board was, but they said that they do allow volunteer on campuses, even with COVID, but there's like some parameters around it and they said they'd get back to me and I never heard back and I'm not sure who to reach out to about that. Okay, we can do follow up April and then get back to you. Yeah, okay. April, I did request out to the schools that they contact you. So that's something I'll follow up on if you have not received a contact. Okay, okay. thank you. All right, thanks. What I got April on that is it's dependent on the classroom teacher if they wanna let you in, in the classroom at this point. And it's changing right now. So Melissa will probably be able to update you on the most current, but that's where we're at right now from what I understand. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, and we are going to um, end this meeting at 8.31 p.m. Uh, thank you so much, and again, we can always communicate via email. Just send us emails if you have any questions in between time from our next meetings. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, Sonia.